My name is Katrina Hartman and I'm with the Royal Alexandra Hospital Foundation. Um, I just want to welcome you here. We have people from all across Canada joining us tonight, which is really, really exciting. Um, I just want to introduce to you um, the brainchild behind the Between Us uh, webinars, the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society. So um, I am the foundation partner. I work with the Women's Society um, every day. We work very closely with them. So it's a group of women that are in all stages and ages of life who are very passionate and committed to raising excellence in women's health care and treatment. So we raise awareness and important funds for a variety of initiatives at the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. So um, as we embark on this journey together and hopefully unlock some secrets of restful sleep, uh, I just want to introduce you to Brianna Botsford, who's going to be introducing our speakers and leading the question and answer period um, at the end of the presentations. Thanks so much, Katrina. We're so grateful for all the work that you do. Uh, my name is Brianna Botsford. I am a proud supporter of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society, and I'm super glad to be here with you tonight. Welcome to our lecture on women and sleep. I am delighted to extend a warm, heartfelt welcome to the esteemed co-chairs of our Women's Society. Uh, they'll be joining us today to introduce the upcoming lecture and share more about our society's deep passion for supporting women's healthcare. Welcome to Between Us. We're so happy you're here. My name is Rhiannon Adams, and my pronouns are she, her. My name is Vanessa Lancaster, and my pronouns are she, her. We're excited to be here as co-chairs of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society. The Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society welcomes community volunteers from all walks of life to join us as we break down barriers and raise awareness and funds for Alberta's only dedicated women's hospital. A hospital that provides such specialized care as high-risk paternal care, minimally invasive surgeries, and treatment of women's cancers. Since our founding in 2017, the Women's Society has raised close to a million dollars in support of the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. Our hospital proudly cares for women in all ages and stages of life, from a land mass covering a third of Canada, and we are proud to support it. Your presence and support today helps make all of this possible. Thank you. Formerly known as What the Health, we debuted a new brand this year renaming this engaging speaker series, Between Us, Exploring the Mind and Body. Most often conversations that start with just between us come from a place of trust. This rebrand represents the essence of trust where intimate and less openly discussed subjects like personal health matters find a safe space for discussion. We aspire for this new name to reflect the depth of honesty, intimacy, and expert insight shared during these talks by the speakers who join us. Following the event, we'll be sending out a survey via email seeking your valuable feedback. Every participant who completes the survey will be entered into a draw for a chance to win a $25 gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. A heartfelt appreciation goes out to Alberta Blue Cross for their steadfast support as presenting sponsor enabling us to host this informative series. Please join me and Rhiannon in extending a warm welcome to Alberta Blue Cross for the land acknowledgement. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here tonight on behalf of Alberta Blue Cross and I'm honored to respectfully acknowledge that today and every day we are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory. We recognize that the City of Edmonton and us the people here are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of numerous Western Canada First Nations, such as the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. We are taking this important moment here today to acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. 
Thank you, Trish, and thank you to Alberta Blue Cross. I will introduce our speakers this evening for our discussion on sleep. So we have Dr. Sylvia Pagliardini, and she is going to be sharing her knowledge on the effects of sex hormones on breathing and what this means for women in the perimenopausal and menopausal stages of life. Dr. Pagliardini is working to understand the underlying mechanisms of how progesterone and its derivatives affect breathing by looking at an area of the brain that senses changes in carbon dioxide levels and whether using a synthetic form of progesterone can improve breathing in conditions of sleep disordered breathing. Vanessa Colombina is a registered psychologist with Pine Integrative Health, a multidisciplinary clinic that specializes in perinatal and women's health. She works with women transitioning into motherhood and perimenopause, navigating the impact of hormones and role changes on a person's well-being. Vanessa is certified in perinatal mental health, as well as in EMDR. Through the use of mindfulness, CBTI, and EMDR, in addition to referring to other disciplines, clients are able to take a multifaceted approach to managing sleep concerns across the lifespan. So two different takes on sleep for you this evening. Dr. Pagliardini, take it away. Uh, well, thanks, uh, uh, first of all, for having me here tonight. Uh, um, I am an associate professor in the Department of Physiology uh, and a member of uh, the Women and Children Health Research Institute and uh, uh, the Neuroscience Mental Health Institute at the, here at the University of Alberta. Um, my research interests lie at the intersection of uh, uh, neuroscience uh, and uh, uh, respiratory physiology. And so what I thought about talking tonight uh, uh, is uh, um, a little bit uh, or introducing a little bit uh, the idea of respiratory control, how breathing uh, uh, works, and uh, um, how female sex hormones influence breathing. And then I will conclude my presentation with uh, uh, a little bit of uh, work uh, that uh, we have uh, collected in the past uh, uh, couple of years. Uh, so we know that uh, uh, respiration is essential for life. Uh, so the principal role for respiration is really uh, to uh, uh, allow uh, oxygen to come into the organism and CO2 to be eliminated. This process is extremely robust, but still has to continuously adapt to the development uh, of uh, the, the human body, to physiological changes, for example, during pregnancy or in uh, diseases. Uh, for respiration, we definitely need uh, the lungs where air moves in and uh, oxygen and uh, CO2 are exchanged uh, for delivering it uh, through the blood to all the different organs. But uh, uh, um, respiration would not occur if uh, there was not a network of neurons at the level of the brainstem that control respiratory activity. Uh, within, uh, let me put the pointer, um, within uh, this uh, network of uh, neurons in the brain, um, there are neurons that are important for uh, uh, setting the respiratory rhythm, for example, free. I'm sorry? Ah. I'm sorry? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I will continue talking. Um, this uh, uh, set the respiratory rate for frequency and amplitude. Uh, there are other neurons that coordinate the activity of the respiratory muscles, and there are other neurons that uh, respond to changes in uh, uh, CO2 levels at the level of the blood. Um, interestingly, uh, the, uh, the same network that operates in the human brain operates uh, uh, in uh, other mammalian species. And uh, what we know a lot about this network actually is being uh, uh, obtained or has been understood through the studies of uh, these networks, uh, initially in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in cats and dogs, and nowadays in, a in rodent uh, uh, animals models. Um, 
what I uh, usually tell uh, the students in the physiology course uh, is that uh, if uh, uh, this uh, uh, respiratory network uh, uh, was operating by itself in the brain without uh, any feedback or any inputs from other regions in the body, we would all breathe like Darth Vader. But this is actually doesn't this doesn't work doesn't happen uh, because uh, this network continuously receive uh, inputs. Uh, for example, from uh, stretch receptors in the lungs that tell us when the lungs expands, or from muscle and joints uh, during uh, exercise, physical activity, or they receive uh, uh, inputs uh, from the receptors uh, uh, for uh, touch, temperature, pain, uh, stimuli. Or uh, um, this network is also influenced by the presence uh, of uh, um, Stimuling, stimuli coming from uh, chemoreceptors, receptors that senses levels of CO2 and oxygen. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the uh, network uh, continuously receives uh, inputs from the higher uh, regions of the brain. For example, the way I'm talking now, coordinating my breathing, my speech is a lot different from what uh, you are uh, breathing just by listening to my talk. Respiration is, uh, uh, starts with the first breath, but uh, we know that the network that control respiratory activity develops very early in uh, uh, gestation. And uh, uh, these networks not only develops, but also becomes active during gestation. And uh, uh, it's able to uh, send uh, excitation to the respiratory muscles so, so that uh, even the uh, developing fetus uh, starts uh, uh, contracting uh, and uh, the respiratory muscle and expanding the lung. Obviously, this process is not necessary for uh, the transfer of oxygen and CO2 because uh, uh, the growing fetus uh, um, continuously receive oxygen and nutrients through the maternal circulation, but uh, it's very important for developing the lungs and the respiratory muscles so that at the time of birth, uh, the whole network and the whole respiratory system is fully functional. At the same time, uh, respiration changes also in the pregnant mother. Uh, and uh, uh, this has to do with the fact that uh, uh, ventilation increases uh, to really uh, respond uh, to uh, the uh, increased metabolic uh, demand. Uh, if we follow the uh, changes in respiration uh, through gestation, we see that there is a slight increase in respiratory rate, respiratory frequency. Uh, and uh, there is also an increase in tidal volume, which corresponds to the amount of air that is inspired with each breath. In respiratory physiology, we also look at uh, minute ventilation, which is the product of these two uh, parameters, and uh, it's a measure of how much air we inspire with unit time. Uh, so we see that with gestation, we have a progressive increase uh, in uh, uh, ventilation also for the pregnant mothers. And when we look at the changes in sex hormones during gestation, we see that there is a dramatic uh, increase in both uh, progesterone and estrogen throughout gestation. And these changes really parallels the changes that occur with uh, uh, breeding. Interestingly, also these changes parallels with uh, the changes that we see in uh, rodent animals. We uh, even uh, uh, rodents through gestation increase ventilation, increase uh, estrogen and progesterone levels. Um, and uh, um, there is now uh, quite a bit of studies uh, that uh, indicates uh, uh, that and support the idea that uh, progesterone and estrogens and estrogen are potent uh, respiratory stimulants, not only through gestation but uh, through life. How do they work? Well, they work through uh, interacting with uh, receptors, uh, and uh, some of them are located in the lungs, uh, in the respiratory tract, but some of them are located uh, in uh, the brain. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, respiratory structures uh, that uh, uh, neuronal structures that control respiration, 
cardiovascular for me, cardiovascular function or thermoregulations uh, contain receptors uh, that uh, detect uh, levels of estrogen and uh, uh, progesterone. And how do they work in these neurons? Well, uh, progesterone can inter and also uh, estrogen can interact with nuclear receptors or with uh, membrane receptors. In case of uh, the interaction with the, the nuclear receptors, uh, uh, once uh, the progesterone uh, binds to this receptor, it goes into the nucleus of the cell and uh, uh, activates a slow process uh, that uh, usually consists uh, in uh, the uh, production of new protein, changing therefore biological function in these neurons. Uh, alternative. Uh, these uh, uh, hormones can interact with membrane receptors and activate uh, a, a non-genomic uh, uh, pathway. So uh, this uh, can cause, uh, uh, in a very fast process, uh, activation or inhibition, excitation or silencing of cells. Um, And uh, uh, when uh, we uh, talk uh, or when we think about uh, uh, respiratory disorders, uh, uh, we uh, have uh, two types uh, in general uh, of uh, disorders. The ones that uh, uh, really affect uh, the lung and the respiratory system, uh, for example, asthma, for example, COPD, for example, cystic fibrosis. But there is an entire classes of disorders uh, that uh, is involved uh, with the uh, disturbances or it's caused by disturbances at the level of the respiratory network in the brain. So there's networks in the brain that control uh, respiration. These disorders occur prevalently during sleep. And this is because all the excitatory events, all the excitatory inputs that I just described uh, are really depressed uh, during sleep. And uh, uh, during sleep, therefore, we may have occurrence of uh, uh, sleep disorder breathing. This can manifest as obstructive or central sleep apnea or uh, conditions of uh, hypoventilation syndrome. For example, in hypoventilation syndrome, we have a shallow breathing, low frequency, low uh, amplitude of each uh, breath that overall reduces the amount of uh, the oxygen that we intake and uh, uh, causes accumulation of CO2 uh, in the body. Um, when we talk about obstructive and central sleep apnea, uh, we have uh, uh, two different uh, uh, phenomena. For example, in case of obstructive sleep apnea, uh, we have uh, a system that tries to breathe, uh, but uh, there is an occlusion at the level of the upper airways and air doesn't move in or out because of this occlusion. Just think of uh, um, uh, a subject that has a very serious snoring. And uh, impairment. In case of uh, uh, central apnea, uh, instead uh, not only there is no airflow, uh, air that moves in and out of the mouth, but there is also no respiratory effort. And this is usually associated with the fact that the network that drives respiratory activity is depressed. Uh, interestingly, uh, Obstructive sleep apnea occurs mostly in the adult population, whereas uh, central sleep apnea uh, occurs uh, uh, in uh, the, uh, for example, in premature babies uh, or in patients affected by uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And when we look at uh, the epidemiology of uh, obstructive sleep apnea, we see that uh, in the adult life, uh, uh, males are uh, more frequently expressing these disorders. Women, throughout their adult life or premenopausal period are somehow protected uh, in, from uh, this, uh, the occurrence of these disorders. But with uh, uh, menopause, uh, the uh, frequency of obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing in general uh, becomes uh, very comparable to uh, what happens uh, in uh, um, the male uh, population. And why is that? 
Well, uh, Vanessa probably has a lot more, will tell us a lot more about uh, sleep and how sleep uh, changes during uh, the menopausal transition. But uh, uh, what, uh, what I wanted to report here is that uh, uh, during the menopausal transition and postmenopause, estrogen and progesterone levels uh, uh, gradually decrease. At the same time, as probably Vanessa will describe in more details, uh, sleep behavior change. We have an increase in insomnia, an increase in awakening, and a reduction in sleep duration and quality. And all these changes in uh, sleep and uh, uh, breathing uh, are also uh, associated with uh, other disturbances that uh, uh, we can experience during menopause. Vasomotomor symptoms, night sweat, uh, um, uh, uh, aging process, increasing stress hormones and wound disorders. And uh, uh, these uh, uh, data and uh, the epileptological data that uh, uh, really investigated uh, the uh, effects of sex hormone on sleep disorder breathing suggest that uh, indeed uh, progesterone and estrogen has a stimulatory effect on breathing. And uh, there is uh, several uh, uh, clinical uh, data that uh, suggest that uh, in uh, mm, uh, a large part of the women population, hormone replacement therapy may help improving sleep and sleep disorder breathing. Uh, the uh, my lab, uh, which is uh, very much interested in uh, really studying the basic uh, mechanism of respiratory control, of how uh, drug uh, influences uh, uh, breathing, became interested uh, uh, to uh, in studying the interaction between uh, hormones and uh, uh, respiration. Uh, when a few years ago we started uh, uh, looking at uh, the uh, uh, mechanism the pathogenesis and uh, potential therapies in uh, this uh, disorder, uh, which is congenital central hypoventilation syndrome or CCHS. Uh, this is a rare genetic disorder uh, that presents uh, with uh, several autonomic dysfunction. We have ophthalmologic problems, respiratory, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, neurological, and pseudomotor uh, disturbances. The pathology or this disease is caused by the mutation of FOX2B, uh, which is uh, a, a gene that is very important for the development of uh, several neurons uh, in the nervous system that control these uh, uh, functions. And depending on the severity of uh, this mutation, we may have uh, a, a different severity in uh, the clinical symptoms of a disease. Um, because uh, uh, as uh, the uh, uh, disease uh, name indicates, uh, respiratory respiration and particularly hypoventilation is a very important uh, clinical and life-threatening uh, uh, condition in these patients. In fact, uh, these patients uh, uh, often uh, present uh, with uh, uh, a reduction in the respiratory rate, a reduction in tidal volume, uh, presence of uh, apneas, and these events occur mainly during sleep. Um, having uh, this, uh, this shallow breathing uh, causes overall uh, an increase in the CO2 levels in the lungs and in the body. And this is due to the fact uh, that uh, the network that control uh, the response to CO2 are impaired. An example of uh, this uh, uh, impairment is shown in this, uh, uh, in this graph, where um, this is a, um, the results of a uh, rebreathing test where a patient uh, basically uh, uh, gradually increase uh, the level of CO2 in the inspired air and in the, uh, uh, in the body. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, a healthy subject like me or you, uh, with the increasing level of CO2, uh, will increase uh, ventilation. So we will we'll breathe more because we want to eliminate uh, CO2 from, the, from our body. But a CCHS patient does not have that response. A CCHS patient, even in a high level of CO2, maintain a very uh, low uh, ventilation. 
Uh, these patients, uh, unfortunately for these patients, there is no really a drug uh, or a treatment uh, that uh, can uh, improve uh, this, uh, uh, this condition. But uh, the respiratory um, condition can be uh, controlled uh, by mechanical ventilation or diaphragm pacing, especially during sleep. Um, uh, but uh, a few years ago, uh, there was an interesting finding where they saw that uh, the same patient that had no response to, to increased levels of CO2 in a uh, checkup appointment, in a regular uh, checkup appointment, uh, demonstrated uh, the increase and improvement in the CO2 response. It did not be, she did not behave like a, a normal healthy patient, but the CO2 response was increased. Uh, this triggered a lot of interest because uh, it was it's, um, uh, uh, it showed that uh, there was an improvement in recovery on their uh, ability to respond to uh, a CO2 um, challenge. When uh, the uh, the team of uh, doctors uh, uh, further investigate uh, this uh, this patient so that the only clinical uh, difference, uh, the only change that uh, this woman incurred was uh, the uh, introduction of uh, a uh, contraceptive, um, desogestrel. This is a drug that uh, is very similar in uh, uh, chemical composition uh, to uh, progesterone. Uh, it uh, is actually 25 times more potent uh, than uh, than progesterone. And uh, uh, the same group of further um, uh, completed uh, additional studies and look at uh, this uh, patient and other patients treated with uh, disogestrel and show that uh, uh, there was not only an increase in the ability to respond to high level of CO2, but there was also an increase, as you can see here, in the frequency of uh, normal ventilation. So this woman really had a stimulatory effect uh, triggered by the use of uh, this uh, contraceptive. And this effect was reduced when uh, patients uh, uh, eliminated desogestrel uh, as a concept contraceptive in, uh, their, uh, uh, in their life. Uh, this obviously uh, intrigued several clinicians, uh, CCHS patients, their family, because uh, it opened the uh, perspective or it opened the possibility of uh, uh, treatment for this uh, rare disorder. Um, they uh, conducted other studies, uh, uh, but uh, uh, these studies gave a little bit of a contradictory result. In some cases, this Ozirstral was active, in other cases, was not active. And also, it opened questions uh, uh, such as uh, what is the mechanism of action of uh, this uh, drug? Where does it uh, work? Uh, in uh, the brain or in the peripheral tissue, and uh, uh, why uh, this uh, drug is effective in certain patients and not in other patients. So uh, in our lab, uh, we decided uh, to uh, look uh, at uh, the effect of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this drug in our uh, animal models. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we use uh, next planar rods. Uh, these uh, next planar rods is shown here. Uh, they are uh, little rods uh, that are used uh, by uh, women for long-term contraception. They usually get inserted in the arm and uh, they are designed to release uh, a very low level of drugs uh, over a, a three-year period. So we just uh, cut, uh, um, size adjusted uh, the rod for uh, the uh, little uh, uh, rats and decided to record respiratory and metabolic function over a long period of time and uh, uh, collected uh, the brain regions uh, um, that uh, contain the receptor for progesterone and uh, um, that are important for respiratory control in order to analyze gene uh, and protein expression. Um, I don't, uh, uh, I, I will not go into the details of these studies, but uh, what we saw in this study was that uh, there was a specific area in the brain, uh, the solitary tract nucleus, uh, where we observe uh, uh, genomic changes. So, and in particular, we saw changes in FOX2B, 
uh, which is uh, the gene that is involved in uh, CCHS and uh, in uh, the uh, changes in the expression of the proteins uh, that uh, FOX to be regulate, suggesting that uh, uh, really um, the uh, next plan on drug could uh, affect uh, progesterone receptor and uh, promote uh, uh, change, uh, biological changes in this area of the brain. Then we also saw that there was a reduction in uh, oxygen consumption and uh, uh, so how much oxygen the body uses and uh, a overall uh, hyperventilation indicating then the, the, uh, um, our, uh, in our uh, experiments uh, there was an increase in ventilation that was higher or the rats were ventilating higher uh, than uh, uh, what they really needed uh, for uh, uh, maintaining uh, uh, adequate oxygen levels in the body. And we also saw a modest but significant increase Increase in the way that these rats responded to CO2, suggesting that in healthy female rats, nexplanon was uh, uh, had that uh, stimulatory effect on uh, ventilation. Uh, we also uh, look at uh, uh, the uh, possibility that uh, this drug could uh, improve uh, conditions of hypoventilation. In this case, uh, we uh, use a model uh, where we uh, kill the cells that specifically activate uh, the network, activate the respiration in response to CO2. Uh, we obtain uh, a group of uh, um, subject that uh, had uh, one uh, that um, uh, demonstrate uh, the reduction of about two thirds of the cells and another group in medial lesion and another group with a large lesion where pretty much all neurons were destroyed. And then uh, we uh, basically run the same experiments that were run uh, in uh, CCHS patients. So uh, we uh, made our little rats uh, breathe normal air that usually has no CO2. And then we gradually increase uh, the uh, CO2 levels. And you can see here that in a healthy rat, uh, uh, we have an increase in amplitude and increase in frequency uh, as a response. But uh, the rats that uh, lack uh, these uh, uh, neurons uh, did not respond, uh, respond uh, in uh, terms of increasing frequency or increasing amplitude uh, in uh, uh, higher high level of CO2. And here is uh, really the population data. They show the same uh, results. And you can see the difference between our control rat, uh, healthy rat, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, rats uh, that uh, instead uh, lacked the CO2 response. So what happened to these rats if we start treating them with uh, this uh, progestin drug? Well, uh, we see that uh, the uh, rats with a very large region where, they, where lesion where basically no CO2 responsive cell were present uh, did not respond uh, over the four week uh, treatment uh, uh, to uh, the uh, progesterone uh, drug. But uh, in uh, the uh, rats uh, that uh, uh, had a uh, medium lesion, the uh, rats slowly recovered from uh, this uh, CO2 impairment, suggesting that uh, the uh, recovery induced by this uh, drug is dependent on the lesion of the size, so it depended on the level of the impairment, and uh, it uh, uh, this recovery requires time, suggesting that probably nuclear receptors are involved in this process. So uh, our uh, studies on uh, uh, this uh, in this model and uh, with uh, this uh, potent progestin drug suggesting that uh, uh, Nexplano has a stimulatory effects uh, both in healthy female rats uh, and uh, in uh, um, a model of hypoventilation. But the effects are really dependent on the severity of uh, the disorders. So this uh, 
uh, how does this relate with uh, CCHS and in general uh, to a uh, hormone uh, therapy? Well, it uh, oh, sorry, it uh, relates uh, to the fact that uh, the uh, level of the impairment uh, um, uh, can affect uh, the outcome of uh, the treatment. Uh, progesterone and possibly estrogen are stimulatory uh, have a stimulatory effect on respiration, uh, but uh, if uh, there are other uh, um, um, uh, other disturbances in the body, uh, these uh, uh, progesterone receptors uh, may um, uh, may uh, not uh, be sufficient uh, for an effective therapy. Um, also, these results help explain why there is so much variability in the response of CCHS patients treated uh, with uh, uh, progesterone. And that's because um, in uh, uh, According to the mutation of the entity of the mutation of this of the gene, we have different levels of disorders, and only the patients that have a small mutation and a more manageable respiratory disturbances can be positively treated with with nesplanon. In terms of uh, research going on in our lab, uh, we are very interested now in understanding how uh, this uh, uh, drug, uh, uh, where does this drug act in the brain? Uh, we have a few potential candidate regions in the brain uh, that could be um, um, involved in these disorders. And what is, uh, uh, we're also interested in the better understanding what is uh, the uh, mechanism of action in the brain. So that that uh, we can uh, really target uh, uh, potential uh, treatments uh, in uh, uh, conditions uh, of uh, uh, hypoventilation and potentially sleep disorder breathing. Uh, then we are also uh, interested in going the opposite way to what uh, uh, the big pharmaceutical companies do. Uh, we know that a lot of drugs are designed uh, uh, to uh, address uh, uh, or they have been tested first uh, or developed first uh, in the male population. Now we are instead and then um, uh, uh, used in the female population. We are in this interested instead in going into the opposite direction. We know that the male brain has uh, progesterone, that there are progesterone receptors, so we will be interesting also to see if uh, this effect uh, translates uh, to the uh, male population. And then last, I'd like to uh, thank the people in the lab, in particular Dr. Uh, Silvia Cardani and Tara James, uh, that are really the drivers for this uh, project, our collaborators uh, at the University of Milan, and uh, the funding agencies uh, uh, that uh, really supported uh, the, the work uh, that, uh, that we are doing on this topic, uh, and Organon uh, that uh, is uh, providing the next plan on road for our experiments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we will be answering questions uh, towards the end of the evening. So we'll let Vanessa uh, take over for, for now. And then um, once Vanessa's all finished, we'll dig into the Q&A portion. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be here and talk with you all about sleep in the perimenopausal period. Um, many of you might even see some information that maybe crosses over to other hormonal periods too, like the perinatal period, um, and even some information across the menstrual cycle too could be of service here. Um, but the bulk of the research that I looked at was specific to perimenopause uh, for the purposes of this lecture. So um, here's just some information, ways that you can connect with me and some services um, with the clinic that I work with. So as was introduced, I um, work at Pine Integrated Health. We're a multidisciplinary clinic that really aims to kind of provide holistic wraparound kind of service for different um, pieces that women are experiencing. And perimenopause is one of those. So what the things that I want to cover today is look at the impact of life stressors on sleep, particularly the life stressors 
that are unique to the midlife and perimenopausal stage um, because these stressors um, culminate at this age period and they're a bit different than where they are in other lifespan um, places. I also want to look at the role of anxiety in general on sleep struggles and then how we can take a multidisciplinary approach to support improving sleep. So some things to consider when we're talking about life stressors during the midlife period. Um, it's quite complex because of the number of responsibilities that uh, folks have. So parenting is one of them and we have parenting kind of across a variety of ages at the men perimenopause stage. So we have women who are parenting little still all the way up to women who are parenting um, adolescents and young adults, all of which come with their own unique challenges too. And then we also have maintaining partnerships or potentially going through separations or divorces, things like maintaining careers, um, caregiving for aging parents. This time of life is often referred to as the sandwich period because women are caregiving for their own children while also caregiving for the generation ahead of them, um, which increases that complexity of responsibility. Many women at this age may also be navigating their own health challenges, whether those are related to perimenopause or not the hormonal fluctuations that come with that, and also just changes in fertility. Um, so as some women are entering into perimenopause, um, they may not be done um, family planning at that point. So that may also be an added challenge that they're facing as well. So the kind of themes that we're looking at here are those multiple and transitioning roles or identities. So at this stage of life, women have multiple roles that they're fulfilling. Some of them are stable, but many of them are dynamic. There's grief and loss as we transition between those different roles, as well as grief and loss with things like potentially partners passing or parents and other family members who may be dying. Um, that adds to the complexity too. grief and loss with children leaving home with changes in career, et cetera. And what we do know is that stressors worsen perimenopausal system uh, symptoms. So there's a bit of a bi-directional effect that can occur here where perimenopausal symptoms can create stress and stress can worsen those um, symptoms, which is why I find a great deal of value in taking a multidisciplinary approach in managing what's happening. So we'll take a quick look here at the variety of stressors that are involved, um, more so to kind of validate what the experience is for, for women here. Um, so we have systemic stressors like sexism and ageism, racism, potentially um, we may have for some women um, stressors related to discrimination for um, gender fluidity and sexuality as well. There may be resource scarcity for some women, particularly in our current um, kind of context when we think about the, the insane amount of um, grocery costs right now that keep growing. If you're in a single income home or you do have changing kind of career things because of all the caregiving you're, you're doing, that can increase the scarcity that some women experience. There also may be a lack of understanding of a, and accommodation for those life stressors within the workplace. So um, it's possible that your workplace may not be adaptive in allowing you to attend medical appointments for your children, for your parents, for yourself. Um, and those are things that have to be navigated that can contribute to stress and chronic stress as well. Physical stressors that are compounded by the perimenopausal period include things like hot flashes and night sweats. Um, obviously, those in particular can compound the sleep issues that some women experience as well. Then, as we just heard in the last lecture, there's uh, general sleep disturbances as well, which can reduce our capacity for being able to handle things. And then sexual dysfunction may be a part of the, the milieu for women in this age um, demographic as well, which can add to the stressor and even that sense of like grief and loss and changing identities and such. 
There are psychological and cognitive stressors as well. So um, anxiety and depression have been um, correlated with hormonal fluctuations. We see the perimenopausal period as being a key risk factor in developing depression. And that's when um, many women are most likely to actually develop depression symptoms. Again, due to all those other pieces we were kind of just talking about. Also, the fluctuating hormones, those drops in estrogen and the drops in progesterone do increase risk for things like anxiety and depression, which can be also seen in the perinatal period and even in adolescence as menstruation starts as well. Um, and women who have fairly consistent uh, menstrual cycles can potentially even track changes in their anxiety and depression symptoms across the menstrual cycle too. So we do know that these pieces are quite sensitive to those hormone changes. The positive news that we have is that there's many protective factors for these stressors. So social support is a big one, whether this is from friends who kind of can validate, and understand where we're going from, going through um, partners or spouses who may be able to um, pick up some extra roles around the house or understand why we're not functioning at the same capacity that we might have beforehand. Role and goal maintenance and achievement can be a great protective factor too. So as we have these kind of roles changing and transitioning, if we're able to maintain some of the goals we have or some of the roles that we have, that can create a bit of an anchor point for us, which can feel stable and can feel like something that we can be certain or trusting in amongst all the other change that we have. Having a sense of self-efficacy or that belief that I can handle the challenges that are facing me. I have the resources to do that. That's a protective factor. Self-acceptance, so that idea of being able to have neutral thoughts, potentially even loving thoughts about um, where you're at in life, the challenges that you have, the strengths that you have. And then self-compassion is a huge protective factor as well. So those are those abilities really to talk to yourself in the same way that you would talk to your best friend or talk to your siblings. Um, so being really loving, accepting, um, non-judgmental, these are all really protective um, factors for us. And this is where therapy in particular could be helpful is we can, in the therapeutic setting, help you build up some of these protective factors that you already have in place and help you find new ones as you transition into that midlife. What we know about stress and hormones is really important for our understanding of sleep. So stress leads to the release of cortisol, and this is meant to be adaptive. This isn't a bad thing. We're supposed to have a stress system that works and allows us to kind of respond to um, situations as they arise. When it becomes maladaptive or it becomes not super helpful is when we get into the situation of chronic stress. And this is when that cortisol that's being pumped through our body ends up being there long term. And we're not seeing those highs and lows in it that we should see during the stress response. So that chronic stress can lead to heightened levels of cortisol for a really long time. And that can impact our, our body's ability to create estrogen because both cortisol and estrogen actually get produced from the same kind of molecules in our body. And so if that energy is being used towards cortisol creation, then it can't be used towards estrogen creation. And then that can further compound the decreases of estrogen that we're already seeing in the perimenopausal period. And if that's the case, then that could potentially promote more hot flashes um, increased risk of anxiety and depression. So we can see there's really this like interplay of what's happening. And then um, cortisol, as many of us know, also plays a role in even being able to sleep, right? So if we have lots of cortisol surging through our body, it's harder for our body to get to a rest state to be able to sleep. So when we think about ovarian hormones and sleep or sex hormones and sleep, um, what we do know is that the quality and quantity of sleep that we have does change or fluctuate across the menstrual cycle. So we do find greater sleep disruption during the luteal phase. 
And this is likely because progesterone levels um, increase post ovulation or a change. And then that progesterone raises the body temperature and we need a lower body temperature in order to sleep. So one of the things that can be really beneficial for helping us sleep is lowering the room temperature um, where we are sleeping, changing the type of blankets we're using. It might even be beneficial to have um, two sets of blankets in our beds, maybe one for our partners who don't need such cool temperatures and then, um, and then a cooler blanket or maybe even a sheet for those of us who need that. Um, another way that we can drop body temperatures heading into bedtime is to take a warm bath or a warm shower. And then when you get out of the shower, your body temperature is going to decrease because you're coming into that ambient or room temperature afterwards. So that potentially could help as well. We also know that increased estrogen levels may be linked with better sleep because estrogen is linked with lowering our body's temperature. So all those things we were just talking about would be linked here. And it may also play a role in consolidating our sleep. So that would mean that we're getting better chunks of sleep versus those fragmented pieces of sleep. The thing that's quite interesting, though, is estrogen's impact on sleep seems to be different than progesterone's. It seems that progesterone has a greater impact on sleep than estrogen does. So even when our estrogen levels are a bit higher, if our progesterone levels aren't quite where they're supposed to be, as we saw in that other lecture just before, um, that can still impact our um, sleep. And we also see this in other conditions like um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, where those progesterone levels and estrogen levels um, aren't stable. So when we think about perimenopause and postmenopausal sleep, we know that 40 to 60% of women report subjective levels of sleep complaints. So that's when they do a survey or when they talk about how they, they sleep, they have a number of complaints about the type of sleep. And some of the things that are contributing to this is that increased amount of awakenings. So that's that piece about fragmented sleep. They have poor sleep quality. So we know in the perimenopausal and postmenopausal um, period, we're not getting as deep of sleep. We tend to spend more time in that, um, in those lighter sleep periods, and which just often isn't as restorative for folks. There's overall trouble sleeping. So that might be trouble getting to sleep and then trouble staying asleep. There is restless leg syndrome that increases in this period, similar to in the perinatal period, which can um, just make it difficult to feel comfortable in bed. And then there's also increased sleep apnea, as we just heard all about. So there's a number of things at play physiologically that are happening that impact sleep within the peri um, postmenopausal. And I think for many women, this can feel almost like there's lots of things that are out of their control and can cause some anxiety when it comes to sleep. And so that's the pieces that we can work on in the therapy setting is how can we gain some empowerment when it comes to sleep and decrease some of the anxiety around it so that we can manage the pieces that are within our control. So I think it's important that we kind of look at what's a sleep challenge versus insomnia, um, because lots of people kind of make use of the word insomnia when they talk about sleep issues, but there is a very specific um, metric used for that that is important when talking to doctors or looking for potentially some, some medical help. It also is important because of the role cognition plays in um, our sleep challenges. So we are more likely to sleep poorly when we think we are sleeping poorly because it creates anxiety about sleep. So when we're defining our sleep troubles as insomnia, if it's not actually insomnia, we may be painting a worse picture than what it is, which could be creating some undue anxiety for it. Okay. So insomnia is when we're dissatisfied with the sleep quantity or quality that we have, either because it's hard to get to sleep, it's hard to maintain that sleep, or we're waking up so early in the morning and are unable to get back to sleep. This needs to cause a significant amount of distress or impairment in your day-to-day -day functioning. And this needs to occur at least three times a week for at least three months, okay? 
And this is occurring despite opportunities for sleep. So that's an important um, piece to include here, because if we think about like the perinatal phase, um, there isn't the same opportunity to sleep. So then it kind of changes how you would be defining insomnia. Okay. When we're looking at insomnia, we're looking at three contributing factors. And these three contributing factors we would want to address from a multidisciplinary perspective. So we have some predisposing factors. Those are some of the things that we've already named, those like physiological pieces, those hormone fluctuations, hot flashes, restless leg, those pieces that are happening within our body that may require some medical intervention potentially. We also have precipitating factors. These are going to be the context that's around in our life. So this might be um, a really stressful event, maybe um, a layoff from work or a parent with a chronic illness. Those can create um, sleepless nights because of the level of stress tied to them. Okay. And then we have perpetuating factors. These are any or thoughts or behaviors that we have that take this acute or small chunk of insomnia sleep and turn it into something more chronic, okay? For most people who do not have a medical reason behind sleep challenges, what we find is it's our thoughts and behaviors that are actually contributing to many of the sleep issues. So if we can tackle those, then we can really help people feel um, more empowered and feel um, better about the sleep that they can get. From a psychological perspective, some things that we want to consider are making sure we're addressing those physiological factors. So when I work with clients, I really make sure that we're not working in isolation. If there's things like low iron, insulin levels are um, unstable, there's fluctuating hormones due to perimenopause. Those are all pieces that need to be addressed or looked at. And the piece that we can get out of doing that is hopefully externalizing a bit of the problem. Oftentimes clients try really hard to change things in their lives or to change their sleeping patterns, for example, but if they have these physiological pieces happening that um, are making it so that some of those other changes aren't working as well. We can sometimes internalize that as I'm not doing enough, I'm not good at this, and then that becomes really disempowering. So when we can bring those physiological factors in play, we can say, look, you're trying really hard. You're doing what you can do. And there's these additional challenges. And we need to take that into consideration. We want to really work with stress reduction or stress management. Um, as we've already talked about, there's, there's increased levels of stress in this time period. And stress really does impact our ability to sleep. So when we can manage those stress levels, then um, we're going to set ourselves up for a bit more success sleep-wise. And then we also want to address the cognitive and behavioral factors at play. So those negative sleep thoughts that may have, maybe some um, behaviors that are making us more aroused at night versus sleepy at night. And when we can do that, then that can also benefit our sleep. So some stress reduction strategies that can be really beneficial is um, self-care, anything that we can do for ourselves, and also care from others. I always use that phrase self-care with caution when speaking with clients, because I think it puts a lot of onus on the individual to make sure that they're okay. But we work within systems and for women in particular, we tend to be caregivers for others and we do need to have some caregiving coming our way as well. So there's there's a balance between what can I do for myself and how can I reach out to the people in my networks to get some extra care as well. Talk therapy can be really beneficial to work through some of those stressors to explore what's in my control, what's not, um, to change our relationship to those stressors, gain more acceptance for them. And then mindfulness-based stress reduction training can be really powerful for managing those stressors. This is basically training that um, teaches clients how to um, change their relationship with their thoughts so that they can have thoughts kind of 
be present and go on their own without having to engage in them when they're not so, so helpful. And it provides some good um, grounding and good kind of capacity building that can be beneficial across the lifespan. And there's some really solid research out there around the role of mindfulness-based strategies for managing um, menopausal symptoms. Okay. One of the key things that we can use for sleep is something called CBTI. It's Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. You can do this with a therapist. There's also a number of apps out there now that can walk you through um, what these steps are and what these strategies are. Um, so there's, there's a variety of ways of kind of gaining access to CBTI information. Essentially, CBTI is a like structured protocol program that teaches clients um, myths and facts about sleep, what we actually need for sleep, what we tend to um, get for sleep and how that impacts our functioning. It takes a look at the negative thoughts that we might hold about sleep and teaches us how to reframe them. And then it also looks at things like sleep hygiene. Okay. One of the big pieces in CBTI is improving what we call sleep efficiency. Sleep efficiency is the amount of time that we spend in bed actually asleep. So our goal is that we have an 85% sleep efficiency. And how you figure that out is the amount of time you sleep divided about by the amount of time we are actually in bed. The reason why this is important is we tend to compensate for a poor night's sleep or for being really tired or having like insomnia by actually going to bed earlier. And that sometimes is counterproductive because we might not be sleepy enough when we go to bed at that earlier time. And then we end up staying in bed, tossing, turning, getting more anxious about our sleep, which then is going to make us stay up even later. And then by time the evening is done, we actually didn't spend that much time sleeping. So one of the things that I help clients with when we're working on sleep efficiency is determining what time of morning, what time in the morning they need to get up or want to get up. The ideal amount of sleep time that they have, usually it's about seven hours for, um, for the kind of the average client. And then we need to figure out what time they need to go to bed in order to get that 85% sleep efficiency. Most clients are going to bed way too early. So what we're actually going to do is restrict the time in bed by slowly moving up or moving back their bedtime, sorry. So we would take kind of some data around what is your sleep efficiency currently like. So maybe you spend nine hours in bed and you only sleep for six. That's only a 67% sleep efficiency. So we're going to each night move our bedtime back by 15 minutes until we get to that sleep efficiency of 85%, which would be about like six hours sleeping, seven hours in bed, okay? So as counterintuitive as it might seem to go to bed later when you're trying to get more sleep, it restricts that amount of time where you can be worrying about sleep in bed, okay? We also want to improve the stimuli or the things around us that create that sleep response or make us sleepy, okay? Our goal here is to make it so that our bed and our bedroom are tied with sleep. So that going into bed automatically cues our body that it's sleep time. For many of us, we use our bedrooms and our beds for multiple activities, whether it is work, TV, um, it could, scrolling on our phones, but really we want our beds to be for sleep and sex. And then that way, when we're in bed, we're kind of cued for one or the other of those things, okay? So if you're not sleepy yet, the suggestion is having a different spot in your house, if available, where you can be doing some kind of light calming activities before bedtime. The other thing that we can do is make use of the 2020 rule which is if you don't fall asleep within about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, leave the bed, do something calming, it might be like a puzzle in low light, reading in a low light, some light stretching, try to avoid screens if you can, because that's just going to stimulate you further. 
Give yourself about another 20 minutes. When you're starting to feel sleepy again, return to bed and try again. When you're first doing this, you might have to do this multiple times. Again, it's going to feel counterintuitive, but what this is doing is unpairing that connection between bed equals not sleeping equals stress. So if we can connect those two, then, um, then we can, um, set ourselves up for a bit of success there and do this also in the middle of the night for so for those of us who are waking up um even at two o'clock in the morning if we can't get to sleep within that 15 20 minute mark we want to leave the bedroom come back in okay so we want to unpair that awaking at the same time every day can also really help this yes that also means on the weekends unfortunately there's a little bit of wiggle room there but not much um, again, counterintuitive, but we feel like I'll just catch up on my sleep on a Saturday morning by sleeping a couple of extra hours. The struggle with that now is that we're pushing our wake window to way later in the evening. And now again, we're going to bed at somewhat the same time, but we got up so much later that now we don't have much drive to go to sleep and we're going to be tossing and turning again. Not as big of a deal on a Saturday, but come Sunday night, when we got to get ready for work the next day, then that can be really stress inducing. Some cognitive strategies that we work with in CBTI is changing negative sleep thoughts um, that create anxiety about sleep to more neutral or positive ones. For many people who have insomnia, they'll actually start worrying about sleep even in the afternoon. And now they have this worry in the afternoon and then supper time hits and now they're really worried about their sleep and then bedtime hits and now they're really worried about their sleep. So they actually have cortisol surging through the whole afternoon evening, which is going to make it difficult for them to sleep. So some of these negative thoughts might be like, if I don't fall asleep now, I'm not going to be good in my meeting tomorrow. Or if I don't get um, five hours of sleep, I'm not going to function tomorrow, okay? Or doing that like clock countdown when you wake up in the middle of the night, okay? We want to try to reframe these thoughts into more neutral ones. So something like one rough sleep won't change how I function tomorrow. This is where when CBTI teaches us about myths versus facts around sleep, this can be really helpful there. Many people feel like one night's sleep will just change how they can function that next day, wreck them for the day. The research actually shows us that from like objective or outside measures of that, that that's not the case, that they are actually functioning at the same level or very close to that same level. And it takes several nights of really low sleep before we start to see a huge impact, okay? We can also use, make use of those mindfulness skills in order to not engage with some of those thoughts and let them pass by. As you can see, some of these things are going to be easier said than done. It takes practice. That's one of the benefits of doing this within a therapeutic setting is you can practice this with someone who's coaching you and supporting you through these pieces. Some potential pre-bed relaxation strategies, some gentle yoga or stretching can be really helpful. Um, this can be helpful um, for those who have restless leg syndrome too. Getting a bit of movement in the muscles can make it a little bit less impactful as they're laying down. Um, I'm a big fan of having people create, keep like a pad of paper and a pen by their bed so that they can do a brain dump right before bed or even if they wake up in the middle of the night this is just like whatever's in here whatever random thoughts about the meeting you have tomorrow the lunch you have to pack the field trip form that has to be signed all of that can be put down on paper and by externalizing that that actually gives us a bit of relief and we no longer have to feel like we need to hold this in here in order to be able to do it we know it's somewhere else and lots of people report that they don't even feel the need to look at that piece of paper afterwards. Um, and sometimes it's not even legible if you're doing it in like the dark in the middle of the night. It's just the act of putting it down on paper is beneficial, right? Some meditation can be really helpful. There's lots of great meditation apps out there. Um, some of them have sleep stories. Those are those like super boring, really slow, calm voice stories that are meant to... Um, just give your brain a little something to focus on so it can't focus on the worries and then it kind of lulls you into sleep. 
And then doing things like progressive muscle relaxation, or even um, what I call the light visualization can be helpful. The light visualization is just imagining um, with each deep breath that you take, imagining a color going through your body. And then when you breathe out, imagining a color leaving your body. And then that, again, just gives your brain something to focus on instead of whatever else it's kind of mulling over. The thing to remember with these strategies is they don't always work first time out. And so sometimes we can get frustrated when we're trying to employ them. But I really do encourage you to try them multiple times, find the one that works for you, and um, hopefully you'll see some success from it that way. I'll wrap up with some multidisciplinary pieces to consider. Um, one of our acupuncturists here at Pine, Sonia James, shared some of this information with me in how acupuncture can aid hormone um, regulation. There's also ways that acupuncture can aid relaxation and stress management as well, um, and things like restless leg syndrome too. So um, through the act of acupuncture, you can regulate hormones like estrogen and progesterone. And what has been observed when doing that is it lessens those fluctuating hormones associated with perimenopause. So women do report having um, less hot flashes and night sweats. Their mood tends to be more stable. And this in turn helps improve sleep quality. It can also promote relaxation. It can reduce anxiety and depression symptoms. It can be used for pain management too. So if pain is one of the reasons why you're having a hard time sleeping, that like poor hip is really hard to lay on, you can do some work acupuncture wise um, with that. Um, and it also has been seen to influence our circadian rhythms. And our circadian rhythms is that like internal clock that releases things like melatonin to help us sleep when we're supposed to sleep. So when we can balance those out, um, that can benefit our sleep as well. Um, one of our nutritionists, Megan Hoffman, she's a reg registered dietitian. She shared this information with us on how she helps women in the perimenopausal period. Um, so she looks at those things like macro macronutrient balance to help promote both um, hormone stabilization and production, making sure that um, that lack of nutrients isn't what's contributing to waking up in the middle of the night or having a hard time getting to sleep. Nutrition can also support things like our um, thyroid, which can help with regulating our metabolism. It can help with maintaining muscle, which is um, lost at a greater weight during perimenopause, and then can help stabilize those blood glucose levels, which can impact sleep as well. The other great thing about um, nutrition support is they can explore the different kind of lifestyle factors that might be impacting the hormone pieces that are at play, whether that's like um, over-exercising, um, binge restriction type eating um, cycles. They can look at ways of helping you manage your nutrition given the life stressors that are at play. Um, it's amazing how many moms out there can get all their kiddos a great breakfast and lunch ready to go. And then by the time all of that's done, they haven't actually eaten and they need to leave the house. And now the rest of their family is full of nutrition and, and they don't have any. So that could be something that could be discussed with a registered dietitian too, is how can I do some of these meal planning pieces? What are some, some ways I can get that nutrition in me? And then physiotherapy and massage um, can help with uh, the physical side of things as well as the stress management piece. So we can look at improving pelvic floor health. This is great, again, just for um, mobility pieces, but also potentially for managing some of those like nighttime um, wakings for urinating can help with pain management, which will hopefully create um, longer stretches of sleep. They can help you maintain the physical activity levels that you want to maintain. We know from ample research studies that even a small amount of physical activity in a day greatly improves our sleep. Um, and so we can work with a physical therapist to kind of find ways to integrate that in, make sure that our bodies are prepared for that. And um, massage can also help with those pain management, relaxation pieces, all of which will kind of help that sleep quality and sleep quantity. 
So, you know, the take home that I really want for all of you is you can have a team around you to really support you in these pieces as much as sleep in particular can feel like it's out of our control or these stressors are, are out of our control. We have um, many clinicians who are able to help from a variety of lenses and we can get you operating at your optimal place, given what your body is currently doing. And um, hopefully there's some, some hope in that for you all. So thank you. I appreciate you sticking through this and I hope you found this helpful. Thank you so much, Vanessa. So informative and lots to learn about definitely a multidisciplinary approach and the psychology um, and, and the way that our behaviors can impact our sleep as well. So thank you so much for, for that. Um, I will be uh, facilitating the question and answer portion of this evening. So there are a few questions that have come in here. Um, if anybody has any further questions, please go ahead and drop them into that Q&A box. Um, so the first question that's come in is regarding hormone therapy. Um, and so the question is, um, the participant is understanding that hormone therapy might be uh, helpful to help with disturbed sleep. Um, is that applicable to patients over 70 years of age or do we, do we have information about that? Uh, do you want to answer Vanessa or do you want me to? <laughs> Go uh, ahead. Probably you have more hands-on experience uh, from uh, my uh, reading in the literature. It uh, uh, looks like the hormonal therapy is really um, effective in, uh, but you probably should talk with the clinician, not with me about this, but uh, um, uh, it's uh, probably very effective in the, perimenopausal period. I don't know if Vanessa uh, agrees with this, uh, whereas the data from the epidemiological studies uh, uh, show a little bit less uh, uh, improvement uh, from the sleep disorder breathing uh, uh, point of view in uh, the mature and uh, in the uh, over uh, over 60, sorry, 65 population. So also because, I mean, uh, they could improve sleep, they could improve uh, uh, breathing, uh, but uh, you also want to consider that uh, uh, there are uh, uh also side effect uh, uh, to this uh, to these treatments uh, so I mean you want to see what other uh, condition um, uh, are present in the body if there are ongoing cardiovascular disorders probably on hormonal therapy uh, hormonal replacement therapy is uh, not uh, uh, optional uh, or optimal uh, or for example like me, a breast cancer survivor, probably you wouldn't want uh, to go close uh, to uh, sex hormones. I, that's my point of view. Right, so there's kind of like a window of opportunity for hormone therapy, we think based on the available literature, and it seems like the benefit um, versus risk as we advance in our lifespan may be something to question with your healthcare provider. Vanessa, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I'll chime in from the psych perspective of um, just as we get it into that stage of the lifespan, there are other things that might be at play as well that would be worth mm -hmm. differentiating again with health providers or with a psychologist, um, seeing if there maybe is some undiagnosed depression at play, if there might be um, some cognitive deficits that are starting that might be at play that could be contributing to, or even if you're on a number of other medications, looking at what those side effects are, especially if they have like an interplay of medications. So I think that age mm -hmm. period, you're just doing a bit more of sussing out and parsing out um, what's happening. And that part would um, really need to be taken into consideration when exploring that hormone piece with doctors. But we do know from the literature that menopause symptoms or perimenopause symptoms can last 10 plus years for some women in the postmenopausal period. So if you kind of have your last period in your fifties, potentially, yeah, in your mid sixties, late sixties, early seventies, you potentially could be having some of those symptoms. Yeah. And that's a, that's, 
really helpful because another question that came in was what age is perimenopause roughly? Um, and my understanding is it's not necessarily a specific age that we're like, oh, congratulations, you're 40, you're in perimenopause. Um, it's a constellation of symptoms. Um, would either one of you like to speak to that definition of, of perimenopause? Yeah, I can speak to that. Yeah, you're right. It's a constellation of symptoms that can um, start at any point in that kind of mid lifespan. I think average is often in those early to mid 40s, but there are some folks who have it before 40 um, or who have the start of some symptoms and don't realize that it is perimenopause. And then um, it can last for a variety of time periods for people. What we define as the stop of perimenopause is when we have um, menopause, which is like that year without a period. And then after the year without a period, now we're in postmenopause. So it's perimenopause, menopause, this really small chunk, but we use that phrase as kind of a catch-all. And then we're in postmenopause. Awesome. Thank you for explaining that. Um, question probably for Dr. Pagliardini. Um, do we think that birth control, just based on your, your research with the next one on, um, do we think that birth control might impact a perimenopausal woman having difficulty with sleep maintenance, so difficulty staying asleep? Um. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, um, uh, as, uh, as Vanessa was mentioning, I mean, uh, there is a lot of literature where progesterone uh, uh, has a very uh, important pro-sleep uh, effect uh, um, mm -hmm. in terms of, probably depends also on the pill composition uh, and mm -hmm. uh, other factors. I will know if, uh, um, I wouldn't have a, really an answer for that. Um. Yeah, it's a tricky, it's a tricky one. And I think it's very individualized, right? Something that yeah. probably could be taken up with, with one's um, healthcare provider on a case by case basis. Um, I, I want to pull out this question because I think both of you can probably chime in a little bit. Um, sleep seems to be multifactorial um, and or sleep issues rather are multifactorial. And so um, how does somebody decide what to work on first? It seems like it could be ineffective to try and tackle everything at once. Um, is there a way that somebody could best get started if they were going to tackle something with their with a sleep issue? Oh, <laughs> uh, probably uh, Vanessa has to deal with this on a daily <laughs> on a daily life. I would say uh, from uh, the kind of scientific uh, perspective of uh, a lab or uh, looking at clinical studies, I would say that uh, if uh, sleep is the issue, um, uh, one uh, important thing, uh, and uh, your doctor thinks that there is a physiological. Um, problem associated with that, uh, maybe a uh, sleep study uh, would be a good starting point, at least uh, maybe to eliminate uh, some of uh, biological problems uh, that uh, that can happen. Uh, but uh, I really enjoy Vanessa's talk about uh, this uh, uh, multifaceted approach uh, to deal with uh, insomnia and, uh, and other sleep disorders. Yeah, for me, I usually suggest to clients um, go where the resources are for you so that mm -hmm. we can tackle based off of where you already have support. So if you have benefits to support one thing, we can look at that. Or if you know you can get in with your doctor right away and your doctor is really responsive and listens really well to these concerns, has a good understanding of perimenopause, then that would be a good place to potentially start. Um, when I work with clients, I, I usually recommend that all clients, regardless of hormone kind of stage of life, that they do go get a workup from their doctor anyways, so that we do kind of know if there's physiological things at hand. And the great thing about being in Alberta, at least, is that um, we can get coverage for those things. So it is a fairly low barrier kind of um, resource that we can we can get at and then we can kind of prioritize based off of what the person's goals are. Mm 
And some people want to start with like the easiest thing to tackle to get some confidence and other people want to take the most distressing or problematic thing and tackle away at that first. So whatever is going to kind of help them. I love that starting where your resources are, but then also tackling it from a, like, what is the most distressing or what is the most disruptive situation? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, question about uh, long-term risks of sleep medications. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if either of you feels comfortable speaking to that um, or if that's more of a one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, but I think that lots of people probably have encountered sleep medications at different points in their in their lifespan. Um, and I, I think that there are some that can be habit forming, um, but would either of you like to like to speak to that? I can speak to it a little bit from the CBTI perspective. I mean, medications mm -hmm. are a scope for us as psychologists, but we do talk about um, just some like facts and myths around a medication when we do the CBTI program with clients. Um, and so some things to consider is that long term, we don't know their efficacy and we don't know. So how how well will they work in the long term and what consequences or side effects there are for them in the long term? Um, they also don't give the same quality of sleep as without sleep meds. So often CBTI mm. actually suggests that people wean off of medications under the, the direction of doctors. Um, and many doctors now actually suggest using CBTI as a treatment intervention prior to yes. um, trying sleep medications because of the struggles with them. Um, sleep medications also have been largely studied on male participants. And so we don't have a great understanding of how they interact in the female body, let alone the female body during a hormonal fluctuation. So that's something to really mm -hmm. explore with your doctor. If they're, if, if you're asking for a med or they're suggesting one, those would be some of those risks and benefits that I would encourage clients to ask about. And that's really interesting that you mentioned the the aspect of like the how drugs are are researched because Dr. Pagliardini, you you brought that up as well that like many medications, pharmaceuticals are first researched in men and then we apply that same evidence to women. Um, there's another question here about uh, the research that you've reviewed. Um, would you say that it supports or suggests the notion uh, suggests or supports the notion um, that sleep seems to be uh, disrupted in the perimenopausal menopausal phase of life, even in the absence of vasomotor symptoms like hot flashes or night sweats? I would say so. Uh, Vanessa probably has more uh, information about that, but I think uh, that, uh, yeah, there are so many changes that occur in the, in the body that uh, definitely uh, all the uh, parts of the brain uh, that uh, uh, regulate and control sleep, uh, sleep onset, uh, sleep fragmentation, uh, the passage between different stages of sleep are affected by uh, the changes that occur in menopause. So wild, that hormone roller coaster affects all those systems in our body. I love that slide that you showed from the uh, Endocrine Society uh, 2023 with the little roller coaster of, of hormones kind of right in the middle there. Yeah. That was that was great. Um, and there was a question about. Yeah, <laughs> there there was a uh, question about the resources. Um, that both of you had posted like your slides. Um, and so I just wanna address that that information will be available um, on YouTube, um, our YouTube channel, the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society YouTube channel. If you just Google that, you will find the link to our YouTube channel where this presentation will be uploaded shortly. Um, and there are still lots of questions coming in, but we do like to wrap up uh, and be mindful of, our, of your time. And we are so grateful for both of you as speakers. Um, um, just a couple little housekeeping questions that I think we may as well address right now. Um, one was just, Vanessa, do you know if there is a similar um, clinic space in Calgary? And two, do patients need a referral to access acupuncture at Pine? 
Great questions. I don't know the specific names for clinics in Calgary, but I do know there are some, and I believe there is a specific perimenopause clinic that is actually looking to be opening up pretty soon, if not already um, in Calgary. So multidisciplinary clinics are becoming more, more common. So I would say you'd be able to find something. And then um, at Pine, you do not need a referral for any of our services. So it's all self-referral. You can book online or call and talk to any of our awesome um, admin and they'll be able to point you in the right direction. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then I believe your contact information for both of you is also on the slides. Um, so folks will be able to access that um, from, from that as well. Um, thank you both so much for being with us this evening. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for supporting us at the Lois Hill Hospital Women's Society. And um, oh, I'm supposed to be sharing a, a QR code right now. Um, so I'm just going to deal with that. But basically, um, if you are interested in becoming a monthly supporter uh, of the Lois Hill Hospital Women's Society, uh, please go ahead and do so. You can scan this QR code that's up on your screen and um, that will take you directly to our website. Um, you will also be receiving a feedback survey uh, from us shortly after uh, the presentation this evening. Um, and if you do fill out that feedback uh, survey, you can be entered to win a $25 gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. Um, so you will be contacted if you win, um, which you might really win. Um, and uh, you'll be contacted directly by Alberta Blue Cross for that. So our next uh, mind body discussion between us will be in April. So stay tuned for that. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Pagliardini, Vanessa. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Trish. And a huge, huge thank Thank you to Alberta Blue Cross for your support. Without you, we could not make this event happen. Thanks everyone for being here with us tonight and we'll see you in April.